about the AMT. I'll start with discussing and refreshing everyone with the current rules uh, and the calculation of AMT. We'll then continue uh, with exploring the proposed federal budget, uh, and then we'll finalize with just some observations and key insights. What is AMT? AMT is a parallel tax regime to the regular federal tax regime uh, in which the idea is to um, minimize deductions or reduce deductions, discretionary credits, um, expenses, and others, all in the hopes of ensuring that individuals pay their fair shares of tax. This is um, effectively EMT is a separate calculation in which you compare it to your regular regime and the individual will pay tax the excess, uh, the greater of AMT or federal regime, and any excess of AMT will be able to carry forward for seven years against future uh, taxable income in Canada. The calculation of AMT is quite complex, but we'll try and break it down. You start with your regular taxable income, to which you have, like I said, Reduce deductions, reduce exemptions, uh, reduce carrying charges. So you add CCA and carrying charges on rental property, notably interest expense, to keep in mind. 50% of your taxable of your capital gains is already included in your taxable income, to which for MT purposes you add 30% of the capital gain. So it's effectively included at 80% under the MT regime. Stock option deductions. Stock option benefits net of deductions is also at 80%, mimicking somewhat the capital gain um, inclusion. And then you'd remove losses and carrying charges from tax shelters, resource deductions, um, to which then you'd back out gross dividends, the gross up on dividends, because AMT is taxed on dividends on the cash value. And there is a $40,000 basic exemption, basic deduction that has never been indexed since the implementation of these rules back in 1986. So this gives you, for AMT purposes, your net adjustable taxable income to which you apply against the AMT tax rate of 15%, less allowable non-refundable tax credit. Let's keep in mind donations here. This gives you your minimum amount for, from an AMT perspective. Then you compare it to your basic federal tax, which will just say it's 33% federally, and then you pay, again, the greater of AMT or your federal tax. So current AMT exposures, just to keep in mind uh, where it can really apply, it's whenever there's a mixed match between federal, federal, your federal regime tax or your AMT regime. So capital gains, um, most notably, whenever there's a lifetime capital gains exemption under their federal regime, there's no taxable income, whereas it's included at 30% under the AMT regime. Gains or other exposures are whenever there's a mix of um, capital gains, sheltered by rental loss, or uh, resource deductions. Again, two, two separate treatments under the EMT regime and or the um, regular federal tax. Now let's talk about the new proposals that were introduced by the federal government uh, in March 2023. This is, uh, there's no current draft legislation. Um, it's just a proposal but it's for taxation, you're starting in 2024. A major impact, a major change in the federal proposals is now a full inclusion of capital gains into the AMT tax, net tax, net adjusted taxable income. So now instead of being at 80%, it's at 100%. This is like a disguised increase of your capital gains inclusion rate. 30% on QSBC shares is maintained. So that stays with uh, how it was in the previous regime. What I mean by QSBC gains is the gains sheltered by lifetime capital gains exemption, only 30% of that will be included in your net adjustable taxable income. And then 
a new change, a small typo here, sorry, is 30% of your um, capital gains on donation of public securities will be included in your net adjustable taxable income. It used to be zero. Other changes are full buyback of your stock option deduction. Again, to have your stock option benefit included at 100%, similar to the capital gains. Re uh, limitation of the able deductions and capital loss carry forwards and or non-capital loss carry forwards. I think that's on the next slide, but I'll just mention it now. So carry forwards and losses that were realized in the prior year will now be offsetting AMT only at 50% in the current year. There's a mention about loss carrybacks. There's no, in the slide, not in the federal budget. Um, so we'll see what they say about that. Likely not, it's already surprising uh, the mix match between a uh, prior loss uh, now being carried forward. Other limitations on now certain expenses, interest and carrying charges will also be limited to 50% uh, in your net adjustable taxable income. Um, like I said before, uh, non-capital loss carryovers um, will be also limited at 50%. Other notable ones being deductions for LP losses uh, and employment ex expenses. Final changes um, are 50% of your non-refundable tax credits. Let's think about now donations. I mentioned before it was fully uh, um, as a full tax credit against the current AMT regime. It'll be now going forward limited at 50% of it. So uh, another drastic change uh, when you can think about donations sometimes being large amounts. Um, increase in the AMT rate will go from 15% to 20.5%, but the only good, good portion of these changes is that the basic exemption will be increased from 40,000 to approximately 173,000 and will be indexed on a year-to-year -year basis. I'm saying this is a good portion because that means your first $173,000 will not be subject to the AMT rules. And therefore, this goes really towards where the government wants to be, being um, it'll be AMT will be applicable against high income earners only. I think this slide speaks um, for itself. This is the impact of the tax rates. Um, one of the changes being the full inclusion in the capital gains rate is surprisingly uh, very impactful. You can realize just a pure capital gain on, say, your Bell shares or your Apple shares. If that is your only source of income and it's very large, the new, the new tax rate on capital gains will be effectively federally 20.5% before abatement, whereas it would have been 16.5%. So on a pure capital gain that's, that's realized in a year, you now have a 4% spread between your AMT tax rate and or uh, versus your federal regular tax rate. We've highlighted dividend rates. Um, not much changed there. Uh, we're happy to see that the highest marginal rates for eligible dividends and non-eligible dividends are still higher than uh, under the AMT regime. So not much exposure on that front. Review of certain impacts. So it'll be important now that we go forward into 2024 uh, to try and optimize use of losses in a year with income. So try and align it in the same year because otherwise you may have an exposure be since loss carry forwards are only um, allowable at 50%. Treatment of donations. Donations are often seen when there's a liquidity event. So a big capital gain being realized. Capital gain we remember is um, uh, um, an issue with AMT, there's, there's an exposure already, but even more so now if you donate in the same year, the donation will not shelter um, the capital gain properly under the AMT regime. And then leverage investments. We think about um, the interest expense, that too will be limited at 50%. If you borrow to lend to your company or to your spouse uh, and charge only a small spread, well, now the small spread will be further increase because of the 50% limitation on the expense. So next steps um, that we see is reviewing existing structures. 
trust um, our tax as individuals, right? AMT is only applicable to individuals and trust. So perhaps we want to review what, uh, what the trust uh, holds as properties um, that may be subject to AMT and may have exposures to AMT. Related party loans, like I said, if you loan to your spouse uh, with a small spread, uh, that may be an issue. Uh, potentially consider accelerating gains into 2023 and or donations so as to uh, mitigate against future uh, AMT exposures. And then with respect to legislations, um, when will it come out? Will there be changes when it comes out? Will there be a consultation period? Um, we're not sure yet. And what will Quebec do? Will they fully align, partially align um, to be seen? So that's it. I'll let Andrea continue with international and in intergenerational transfers. So hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. So I'll be talking about the intergenerational transfers. So I'll take you a bit back in time, which is not that far back, but it's really actually just before 2021 when it was actually more beneficial for entrepreneurs to transfer their incorporated business uh, to third party shareholders than to their family members. So we'll take an example, let's say uh, a parent or an entrepreneur has a business, an incorporated business that it carries on actively, it increases a lot in value and now they want to sell it off. If they decide to sell it off to a company that is controlled by their kids or their family, so a related company, the result would be that the increase in value would not be considered a capital gain, but would actually be considered a deemed dividend, which triggers a much higher uh, tax rate. So on a capital gain, if you have a capital gain, let's say of a million dollars, the tax rate is 26% in an individual's hands, and this is before applying the capital gains exemption. Um, if, on the other hand, you now have a deemed dividend, you cannot claim the capital gains exemption because you no longer have a capital gain, but the tax rate goes up to 48%. So you see a bit of difference between the tax rates. So there's been a lot of um, efforts and pressure that's been put by the uh, business community to try to alleviate these, uh, these types of impacts when a transfer happens uh, inside of the family in terms of the business. Um, so this is the provision of section 84.1, which really recharacterizes the capital gain in the hands of an individual from being a capital gain to a deemed dividend. As of 2021, uh, there was a private member's bill that was introduced, which uh, alleviated a little bit the impact of uh, Section 84.1, in the sense that if certain conditions were met, then the parent or the vendor could benefit from the capital gains treatment, and they could apply or benefit from the capital gains exemption uh, to the extent that the shares that were being sold qualified as uh, QSBC shares or Farman uh, fishing shares. So this is a private member's bill. It's just to, to, to know that it's not uh, how generally legislation is being proposed and implemented. Usually legislation... Uh, Income tax legislation is being brought by the Minister of Finance, it goes through the House of Commons, Senate, and then becomes law. In this case, it was really the, uh, the MPs, uh, conservatories, that actually brought this in, and uh, it passed in 2021. So at the moment of the drafting, there were certain conditions that have to be met in order for the vendor or the transferor to benefit from the capital gains uh, treatment. So to the extent you had an individual vendor that had QSBC type shares that they wanted to transfer to a company controlled by their child, they could now do so, uh, only to the extent that the entity purchasing the shares were, was holding it for 60 months, so for five years. Um, to the extent those conditions were respected, now the parent or the vendor could benefit from the capital gains and apply the capital gains exemption, essentially uh, reducing their tax liability on the transfer. The concern at the government level at that time was that transfers were starting to be made to family members, but the owner manager or the entrepreneur was still very heavily involved in the business after the transfer. 
So it wasn't really a genuine transfer between uh, generations, but it was more sometimes it could be done for tax planning to crystallize the capital gains exemption. So, and as part of the budget of 2023, new rules are, are being proposed to be implemented. So a change of the rules in order to give additional conditions so that, um, that have to be respected for a, a lengthier time if, um, in order to qualify for the capital gains exemption and the capital gains treatment. So there's two options currently that are being proposed under the legislation as of uh, part of the federal budget. So there's the immediate business transfer, which relies to a three-year test. So in the next three years from the sale, certain conditions have to be met. Or there's a gradual business transfer, which is a test of five to 10 years. So certain things have to happen um, after the sale, up to 10 years after the sale. So we'll go through the different conditions that have to be respected. Some of them are um, applicable equally to the immediate business transfer and the gradual, and some are really pertaining to each of the, the two transfers. So in terms of the general conditions that apply to both transfers, uh, you have to have an individual vendor other than a trust. So if you have a structure where your trust owns common shares, and you want to do the transition that way, uh, the exemption is not available. So it has to be an individual, a person, um, that is going to transfer their shares. And the individual at the time of the sale, they do have the legal and factual control of the operating entity, which we are calling OPCO in this case. The transfer can happen to uh, a company that is controlled by the vendor's children. And the notion of children has been extended to include nieces, nephews, their spouses, as well as their kids, which wasn't the case before. So there's a bit of um, a better treatment in the sense that you can include more family members uh, other than your kids and grandkids. Uh, the shares obviously have to qualify as QSBC shares at the time of the sale. And the child has to control the holding company or the purchaser entity that is going to purchase the uh, operating shares. After the sales, and this is a three-year test that will apply to both types of transfers, the voting and the growth shares have to be sitting with the child. So this ensures that it's a real or a genuine transfer, whereas the voting and the growth of the value of the business is really going to be passed on to the children and it's not going to reside with the entrepreneur or the owner manager. This test applies to the holding company, so the purchaser entity that is going to acquire the operating entity, the operating entity itself, which is being transferred, and you will also know that I've indicated OPCO subs. So OPCO subs, it's uh, more of a connotation. It's really any entities of the operating company on which the operating entity has to rely on in order to qualify as QSBC. So there are certain tests, it's not the purpose of the presentation. There are certain tests of assets that have to be met um, to qualify as a small business corporation. And if you rely on other entities to do so, those businesses are also taken into consideration when we talk about the, the, the transfer. The following conditions only apply in terms of the immediate business transfer, and there are some conditions that will go after uh, two, which apply to the gradual. So in the immediate business transfer um, scenario, after the sale, the legal and the factual control have to reside with the child. So the parent can no longer be involved in managing the shares or having uh, factual control, whether economically or uh, by way of shares. In addition, within three years, so this is a time up to the three years uh, from the sale, the management of all of the businesses of the entities, the holding company, the operating entity, and the little subs underneath, they have to be managed by the child. So the parent can no longer be involved in the management of the businesses. There's an exception to this in the sense that if there's an exit event, so if there's a sale of the operating entity or the holding company to a third party, the condition is deemed to have been met even though the sale happens, let's say, two years after, which was not the case before because as the current rules apply, 
the holding company that acquires the shares have to keep them for five years. Otherwise, you are busting the tests and you no longer qualify for the capital gains. The other exception is also in case of a loss of a child, so that would be by death or mental or physical impairment. In addition, within the three years uh, from the sale, the child has to retain the control of the operating entity and the purchase goal. So it cannot be a shift of control. It really has to retain the control for the entire period. And the businesses have to continue being uh, carried on. So uh, the businesses that we had at the time of the sale, it's a continuation during a three-year period. Uh, and at least at the end of the three years, at least one uh, child has to be involved. So if in the beginning there's a, a holding company that is either controlled by various ch children, if there's a phase down or a divestiture, at least one of the children from the beginning has to be at the end of the process. So if all of these conditions apply, congratulations, there's no 84.1, which means that the transfer is not subject to the punitive rules of having a deemed dividend, but a capital gain. So if that is the case, um, that's all good news, but there are certain caveats to it. So an election has to be filed by the parent and the children involved in, in the purchase. Uh, all of the parties are now becoming solidarily uh, liable to the extent that there's going to be an assessment. So let's say down the line the government comes back and says, you didn't respect one or more conditions, you don't have the capital gain, you instead have a deemed dividend, this, arise, this triggers a, a tax consequence, all of the parties that are making the election will be liable for it. And the normal reassessment period is extended by three years, which means that instead of uh, the government having uh, three years to come back and reassess, they actually have six years to come back and reassess. And this makes sense because it is a gradual, um, if you want, over three years transfer. And the application of these rules is really for uh, transactions happening on Jan 1, 24 and after. With respect to the gradual, so this is the five to 10 year test. The first five conditions apply. So individual transferor that has QSBC shares, that has legal and factual control. Uh, and then the three years, the parent no longer has voting or growth shares. But in addition to that, there are some other conditions that have to be respected. So. The parent in this situation in the gradual uh, transfer, they can actually keep the factual control over a period of time, but they only have to give up their legal control, which is the, um, the power to elect the majority of the board of directors. Within five years from the sale, the management has to be moved into the children's hands, which is different than the immediate transfer, which was actually providing for a three-year period. So there's more time given to, to pass on the management of the business. Within 10 years from the sale, the parent's economic interest in um, the operating entity and the holding company has to be reduced to 30% or less. So there's still a possibility for the parent to keep on some economic interest, but it has to be gradual, gradually uh, taken down to 30% um, or less. And when they reach that point of 30% or less, we call it the final sale time, which is relevant for another condition that is going to have to be fulfilled, so which is this one. So from the sale until the later of the five years or when the parent reaches that 30% threshold, the child has to continue retaining control of the, the purchaser entity and the operating entity. Similarly to the immediate transfers, the businesses have to continue being carried on and at least one active child has to be involved at the end of the process. The same exception applies with respect to uh, exit or loss of a child. So there's a deemed um, occurring, if there's an exit, the condition is deemed to have been met. And if all of these conditions are met, again, 84.1 will not apply, which means that the parent can get a capital gains treatment, apply the capital gains exemption. Um, but there's a caveat also. So similar to the immediate transfer, uh, there's an election that has to be filed. All parties uh, to the election are going to become uh, liable for any tax implications that, that arise if 84.1 does apply in the end. And the normal reassessment period, and this is uh, very important, is now extended by 10 years instead of three years. So from the time of the sale. 
Um, again, transactions apply in the same way for transactions happening on Jan 1st of 2024 and after. That is pretty much it for my side. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you. Today I'll be speaking about two of the new federal housing measures that came into effect in the last two years and may have practical implications for you and your clients. So the first is the prohibition on the purchase of residential property by non-Canadians. And the second one is the underused housing tax. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is why both of these titles are a little bit misleading. And they uh, cover situations that are not, that don't relate to underused residential property, property and don't relate to purchases of residential property by non-Canadians. So let's start with the prohibition, which is sometimes also called the foreign buyer's ban. This came into force on January 1st, 2023, and unless something changes, will remain in effect for the next two years. The operative rule is on the slide, and it says that it is prohibited for a non-Canadian to purchase, directly or indirectly, any residential property, which seems straightforward enough. The key concepts are non-Canadian, purchase, directly or indirectly, and residential property. The legislation was first released in Bill C-19, which was introduced in April 2022 and received royal assent in June 2023, with a coming into force date of January 1st, 2023. The legislation that enacts the prohibition is itself quite uh, straightforward and very short. It's only eight sections but we had to wait for the regulations in order to understand the actual scope of the prohibition. The regulations were published in the official Gazette on uh, December 21st, 2022, which was only 11 days before the coming into force of the rules. Um, and that includes weekends and holidays, by the way. Um, and the scope of the prohibition was suddenly a lot broader than I think any of us had anticipated. Um, and one example of this is on the slide. Uh, the regulations define one of the key concepts, which is purchase. And the regulations say that the acquisition of a legal or equitable interest or a real right in a residential property is a purchase. So it's not just a non-Canadian purchasing a residential property that contravenes the foreign buyer's ban. A non-Canadian acquiring a residential property, directly or indirectly, can contravene the prohibition subject to some exceptions, which we'll talk about. So we'll talk about another key concept, non-Canadians. Non-Canadians are the people and the entities who are prohibited from acquiring residential property for the next two years. A non-Canadian is an individual who is not a Canadian citizen, a Canadian permanent resident, or registered as an Indian under the Indian Act. And one important thing to note when we talk about residency here is that we are not talking about tax residency. The, the foreign buyer's ban is not a tax measure. Um, we're talking about permanent residence under immigration laws. Another non-Canadian is a corporation that is incorporated otherwise than under the laws of Canada or a Canadian province. Um, but a CBCA, OBCA, or QBCA corporation can still be a non-Canadian. First, if the corporation was incorporated outside of Canada and then continued under the laws of Canada. Um, and second, a corporation that's incorporated under the laws of Canada or a province is a non-Canadian if its shares are not listed on a designated stock exchange in Canada, such as the TSX, and it's controlled by one of these people that we just talked about. Under the regulations, control means 10% or more of the votes or value, or de facto control, factual control. So clearly, this was not drafted by tax people. That's not how we understand control for tax purposes. There are also rules in the regulations that can make an entity that is not a corporation a non-Canadian, and they apply in similar circumstances. Similar test for uh, votes and value for control adapted as required. 
So the key takeaway here is that it can be difficult to determine whether a corporation or entity is a non-Canadian, especially where there are several layers of ownership. So what's a residential property? Residential property generally means real or removable property that is situated in Canada, and that's either a detached house or similar building uh, containing not more than three dwelling units. And a dwelling unit is something that has a private living area, a private bathroom, and a private ki kitchen. Um, this means that a triplex is, is generally a residential property, and a quadruplex is generally not a residential property. Um, the other type of residential property is shown in B on the slide. So B talks about a part of a building that is a semi-detached house, a row house unit, a residential condominium unit, or other similar pre premises that is or is intended to be a separate parcel of real property that is owned or is intended to be owned apart from any other unit in the building. What this means is that a building that has four or more dwelling units and is not subdivided in separate parcels, like in condominium, and is, intended, and is not intended to be owned by different owners, is generally not a residential property. We get a lot of questions about this. Is a multi-residential tower residential property? And the answer is generally no, if it's not subdivided into condominium. There is one important exception to the definition of residential property. The slide mentioned prescribed real properties or immovables. So we didn't know about this exception until the, reg the, the regulations came out. Um, but these are properties that are located in certain non-urban areas, which are defined by reference to Statistics Canada census data. Um, this means that certain residential properties that are located in these prescribed non-urban areas are not residential properties, and they are completely excluded from uh, from the foreign buyers ban. Um, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the CH CMHC, has recently put a tool on their website, um, which is supposed to help you uh, determine whether a re whether a property is excluded from the definition of residential properties by virtue of this exception. So the last thing I'll mention. Um, about residential properties is about vacant land. In the initial version of the regulations, there was a rule that was intended to make residential land, resi uh, vacant land that is zoned residential, subject to the foreign buyer's ban. In my humble opinion, they got it completely wrong. They ended up capturing all types of situations, a lot of commercial situations that were not intended to be caught by, the, by this legislation. And so on March 27th, there was a package of amendments to the regulations. Um, they walked it back. So as of uh, March 27th, they've completely eliminated that rule. Vacant land, regardless of zoning, is no longer subject to the foreign buyer's ban. Okay, so what are the exceptions? Um, the first exception from the, from the foreign buyer's ban is for certain categories of purchasers. The prohibition does not apply to a temporary resident as defined in, under immigration law if certain conditions are met, a protected person as defined under immigration law, an individual who is a non-Canadian and who purchases the residential property with their spouse or with their common law partner um, if the spouse or common law per partner is essentially um, a Canadian, so a Canadian citizen or Canadian permanent resident. Um, and it's not prohibited from purchasing. And then there's an, there are other rules that apply to foreign diplomats, asylum seekers, refugees, under certain circumstances. Second, there are exceptions for certain types of purchases or acquisitions. So we had said that the definition of purchase is very broad and includes prima facie any type of acquisition, there are some exceptions. So there's an exception for the acquisition of a residential property by an individual as a result of death, divorce, separation, or a gift. There's an exception for renting a dwelling unit for the purpose of the unit being occupied by the tenant. There's an exception for the transfer, uh, basically a trust distribution if the trust pre-existed the foreign buyer's ban, so if it was created before January 1st, 2023. 
And there is a new exception as of March 27th that was introduced in response to um, a lot of pushback from the commercial real estate community, which is an exception um, for, to, for, to the ban for the acquisition by a non-resident of a residential property for the purposes of development. And the CMHC has actually published some comments on its website under its FAQs as to um, uh, as to uh, what the meaning of redevelopment is, like what has to happen in order for that exception to apply. So the last thing we'll talk about are the consequences of non-compliance. So as I said, this is not a tax measure. Contravening the rules is a statutory criminal offense, um, which is punishable on summary conviction, and it makes you liable to a fine of up to $10,000. So the non-Canadian the non that contravenes the, uh, the prohibition commits the offence, and directors, officers, senior management who participated or acquiesced, acquiesced in the contravention can also be made parties to this offence. Importantly for this group, every person or entity that counsels, induces, aids, or abets a non-Canadian in contravening the prohibition Knowing that the non-Canadian non is prohibited from doing so is guilty of an offence um, and is liable on summary conviction to the fine. So contravening the prohibition does not affect the validity of the sale itself, but one of the things that the government can do is they can apply to a court, the superior court in the province where the property is located. Um, it's essentially the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion who's responsible for the administration of this act. They can apply to the court and they can apply for an order forcing the sale of the residential property. If that order is granted, the non-Canadian is not allowed to receive more than the purchase price that they paid for the residential property and any excess goes to the government. A slightly happier and more familiar topic, the Underused Housing Tax Act. Um, also a bit of a misnomer because we're going to see why um, in some circumstances a property might not be underused at all and the tax might still apply. So what is the UHT? It's an annual 1% tax on the value of residential property in Canada that is considered to be vacant or underused. The tax itself generally applies to non-Canadian owners, but Canadian owners can and often do have filing obligations and in some circumstances, they might be subject to the tax. The UHT is in force for the 2022 calendar year, and if these rules apply to someone who was an owner on December 31st, 2022, the owner had a filing obligation and potentially a tax liability on April 30th, 2023. Um, if you're thinking you might be late, don't worry. There has been transitional administrative relief that has been granted by the CRA. So essentially, you're OK if you file and or pay the tax by October 31st of this year. There are two components to the underused housing tax. The first is the filing obligation. Uh, a UHT return has to be filed by every person who is an owner other than an excluded owner of a residential property on December 31st of the calendar year in question. The deadline is April 30th of the following uh, calendar year, um, subject to the administrative relief that I just mentioned for 2022. The second component is the tax liability. The UHT is payable by an owner, other than an excluded owner, of a residential property unless an exception applies. The tax is 1% of the taxable value, which is defined to be the greater of the value on the municipal roll and the most recent sale price in the calendar year. So again, the key concepts, owner, excluded owner, residential property. Um, the, the excluded owner concept is very important because an excluded owner has no obligations under the legislation. There's no filing obligation and there's no tax liability. The residential property definition, we'll just talk about it briefly, but it's very similar to the definition that we just talked about in the context of the foreign buyer's ban. So the key, key takeaway here is that if you're an owner of residential property on December 31st and you are not an excluded owner, then you have a filing obligation if you own a residential property. You also have to pay the tax unless an exception applies.
So owners and excluded owners. Who is an owner? Generally, the owner is the person or the persons who are identified in the land registry as being the owner. There are some nuances to this definition. We're not going to get into all of them here, but one important point is that a tenant or a lessee can be considered um, an owner if there is a long-term lease. A long-term lease is uh, a lease that gives continuous possession of the land for more than 20 years, or if there's an option to purchase in the lease. So the second you have a lease with an option to purchase or a 20 plus year term, you should be thinking about whether the lessee is an owner for purposes of the UHT. Again, an excluded owner has uh, no obligations under these rules, no filing obligation, no tax liability. An excluded owner um, needs to be an excluded owner on December 31st of the year. It includes a Canadian, the Canadian government, federal or provincial, or agents of the, the governments. An individual who is a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, if they are the owner in their personal capacity, if they're the owner as a partner of a partnership or a trustee as a trust, of a, a trustee of a trust, they are not an excluded owner. And again, residency is not tax residency; it's permanent residency under immigration laws. Um, a corporation incorporated under the laws of Canada or a province, if the shares are listed on a designated stock exchange in Canada, like the TSX but this doesn't seem to include subsidiaries of publicly traded corporations, so it creates a lot of administrative uh, difficulties. Mutual fund trusts, REITs, uh, SIF trusts, which are all defined terms for tax purposes and we won't get into here, and registered charities. So these are all examples of excluded owners who have no uh, filing obligation and no tax liability under the UHT. There are others, it's not an exhaustive list. So the next key concept is residential property. The definition is very similar to the definition under the prohibition rules that we looked at, uh, that we looked at uh, previously, and I'll let you look at the slide. The one important difference is that um, there is an exemption that relies on non-urban areas, on the property being in non-urban areas, which is known as the vacation property exemption. Those properties are still residential properties for purposes of the UHT, unlike for purposes of the prohibition. So if you're trying to claim the vacation property exemption, you still have to file a return. You still have a filing obligation. Um, so we'll talk about the, ex the exemptions quickly. We're not going to talk about all of them. But to recap, if you're an owner on December 31st of a calendar year and you're not an excluded owner, you have a filing obligation. And the next question is, are you liable for the tax? You're liable for the tax unless one of the exemptions applies. So there are three broad categories. There are exemptions that relate to uh, the owner, there are exemptions re that relate to the use of the property, and there are exemptions that relate to the residential property itself. So the exemptions that relate to the owner, we'll talk about two of them, or two types of them. The first relates to Canadian ownership. So specified Canadian partnerships, trusts, and corporations can claim an exemption from the tax. They have a filing obligation, but they can claim an exemption from the tax if a certain threshold of Canadian ownership is met. And generally speaking, you can't have more than 10% than of non-Canadian ownership. It's a bit of a complicated analysis because you have to look up the chain. The second type of exemption that relates to the owner is the exemption for new owners. So if it's your first calendar year owning the residential property, even if you're not an excluded owner, you can file a return and claim the exemption for new owners. There are exemptions that relate to the use of the property. So the two that are most relevant are the exemption for primary place of residence, which is not the same concept as principal residence under the Income Tax Act. Um, so if the owner is an individual, they can rely on this exemption. And the second, the second category of exemption that relates to the use of the residential property is, is called qualifying occupancy. And this one can be claimed by an owner that is not an individual. So basically, if you have more than 180 days of qualifying occupancy periods, you can claim the exemption. A qualifying occupancy period is a period of at least one month um, when the following categories of good persons have continuous occupancy. So an arm's length individual, if there's a written lease, 
a non-arm's length individual, if there's a written lease and if there's fair rent, which is defined to be 5% of, of the taxable value, the owner themselves being an individual or their spouse, but they have to be in Canada for the purpose of pursuing authorized work under a work permit. Um, and the spouse, common law partner, child, or parent of the owner who is a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. And this is the reason why you can have uh, property that is not underused. It could be used 365 days in the year. But if you, don't, if you don't qualify for one of these exemptions, and in particular, if you don't meet the 180 days of one month periods where a single person has continuous occupancy, um, you can be subject to the tax. So not entirely clear whether very short-term rentals are good enough. And then I'll just mention briefly that there are exemptions that relate to the use of the, re the, the residential property itself. So there's the vacant property exemption that we just talked about, where the property has to be in a prescribed non-urban area and the owner has to use the property for 28 days or more in the calendar year. And then there are exemptions that relate to what you can do with the property if the property isn't suitable for use um, year-round as a place of residence, if it's seasonally inaccessible, if it's uninhabitable because of renovations or because of a disaster, um, and if uh, substantial completion uh, has not been completed in the year or has been completed at particular times in the calendar year, there are exemptions essentially for developers that they can rely on in order to, um, in order to be exempt from claiming, from, from paying the tax. That's a very high level overview of the exemptions to the UHT. There are conditions that have to be met for all of them. Um, and uh, the, the, the CRA has actually issued, they published notices on their website that address a lot of questions. I know for a fact that they've been getting a lot of calls um, and uh, they've published some FAQs that are actually very helpful with examples that can help you in determining whether a particular exemption applies. That's all I have for you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rhonda, for that introduction. It's so nice, first of all, to see everyone here in person. I thank you all for attending. So most of you are probably aware of the different smart giving uh, plans. Today, we'd like to go over them at a high level, but specifically consider how the significant increases in interest rates have an effect on those planning techniques. We also touch upon how these may be affected by the proposed changes to the AMT rules. So as I mentioned, we'll look at the effect of the increased interest rates and proposed AMT changes on private company preferred share gift plans, and the effect of interest rate increases on charitable remainder trusts and on life insurance plans. So in recent years, we've seen many liquidation events and dispositions in the Montreal community. In such cases, where an individual or a corporation may have a huge capital gain, gifts of private company preferred shares can provide tremendous value to charities and also provide significant tax savings to the donors. It's a win for philanthropy and for charities, it's a win for clients because of the significant tax savings, and it's a win for the advisors who are going to their clients with new and innovative strategies. Let's look at an example of how this would work if the donor is a company. So in this example, we have Taxco, who let's say um, sold a huge asset, let's say a building, and got a capital gain of about 6.5 million. So it has to pay tax on that capital gain. By donating shares worth $5 million, it could save 2.5 million of tax. The plan would work as follows. Taxco would subscribe for 5 million preferred shares in Sisterco. Those shares would be redeemable, retractable, and carry a market rate cumulative dividend, which today would be at about 4%. Sisterco now has $5 million. It can choose to invest it, loan it back, or buy real estate. Taxco will then donate those preferred shares of Sisterco to the JCF, and JCF would now own those 5 million preferred shares in Sisterco. Taxco would obtain a valuation of those preferred shares, and the JCF will issue a donation receipt equal to the value of those shares. The result is that Taxco can now claim the $5 million donation receipt on its tax return, saving the $2.5 million of tax. And don't forget that Sisterco still has the $5 million. 
Sisterco would now pay an annual dividend to the JCF, which would go into the family's fund and be granted to the donor's charity of choice. Depending, Sisterco may also be able to claim a dividend refund, which would be an added bonus. At today's rate, a 4% dividend would be $200,000. It's important to note that it's the point of donation that sets the rate. The dividend rate doesn't change in the future with changes to interest rates. Historically, we've been doing 3% dividend rates because of the relatively lower interest rates. And even when rates were lower, we were still doing 3% because we wanted to make sure the charity was being done. Since dividends carry a market rate, cumulative dividend, with the increase in rates, we would now put a 4% dividend. The result then is that interest rates, uh, the higher interest rates now, are higher than they were, say, a year ago, and therefore higher dividends. Of note also is that when this is set up, there should be a plan to redeem the shares. The $5 million at some point would have to be outlaid to the family's fund at the JCF and used towards charity. Sometimes these can be redeemed right away, sometimes over a number of years, 5, 10, 15, sometimes upon death. The idea here is if you have a client that's going through a liquidation event, it's a really great plan that will benefit them. And it's also important to consider this when you're in the planning phase of a transaction. Also, you should get in front of this in 2023, which leads us to the next slide. Okay. The combination of capital gains and charity is very important in gift planning. In the previous slide, our illustration considers TaxCo as a donor, but of course, it could be an individual, in which case we have to consider one of the hot topics of the day, which is AMT. If we look at this example, we have an older donor, Mrs. A. She's very philanthropic and has decided to gift a million dollars of preferred shares of Holdco to the JCF. Let's assume that all these shares are redeemed right away after the gift. That same year, she also expects to have about 200,000 of other income. So this is an estate planning gift. What we're doing is eliminating an asset that would otherwise be taxable upon death. It's a good gift for someone who's senior, who needs the tax receipt now, um, and she can use it against her taxable capital gain, against other income, so it's a, it's a really good gift. This situation could also equally apply to someone who's planning to emigrate from Canada and we're trying to plan around their deemed disposition. So let's look at what happens. She would have a $500,000 taxable capital gain, which is normal. She would also get her donation receipt of a million dollars, but obviously she can only use it up to 75% of her taxable income, the rest she can carry forward. And she'll also have regular provincial and federal tax to pay on the $200,000. Historically, we wouldn't have expected an issue with this sort of result. But now, of course, we have to look at AMT because we have capital gain and we have giving. In this example, we've calculated it to be about $89,000, and of course, that's a federal impact. There's no provincial uh, consideration over here. For the most part, donations by, by themselves should not create an AMT liability, but it's really when donations are coupled with another AMT factor, such as capital gains, that a problem will arise. Of note also is that we have an example here of a million preferred shares. The higher the preferred shares, the higher the impact. But we might be able to plan around this. We just need to be creative and run different calculations and scenarios. So for example, can we trigger the capital gain in 2023 and do the donation of shares this year before the new AMT rules kick in? Can we roll the assets into a company? Because of course, corporations are not subject to AMT. Are there any other taxpayers in the group, such as a spouse, that we can use? Perhaps the AMT is recoverable. That's another point to consider. The takeaway here is that everything is fact specific. Next, we'll look at the use of charitable remainder trusts. In these types of trusts, the capital is held in the trust. The donor would be the income beneficiary and would benefit from the income of the trust for his or her lifetime. The income is, of course, taxable in the donor's hands. And the charity would be the capital beneficiary on death. In the year of establishing the trust, so now, for instance, the donor would receive a donation receipt equal to the residual value of the gift. It would be a partial receipt, 
based on the present value of the contribution, taking into account, of course, appropriate discount factors and the donor's life expectancy. On death, the charity would receive the capital in full. These trusts may be appropriate for a donor who wishes to make a donation and receive a partial charitable receipt immediately, but still desires to use the asset um, and have a right to the future investment income. It works well for older people who don't have children to leave assets to in their will, would otherwise be leaving most of their estate to charity upon their death, and who don't expect a large taxable income at death and would therefore no longer need a donation receipt at that time. It's also important to note that the donor does not have to put all of the capital into the CRT at once. They can do it over time. Since the capital cannot be encroached upon in a CRT, computations would need to be done based on annual cash needs to see how much should be put into the CRT. Of course, the change in interest rates have an effect on the computation of the CRT donation receipt. The higher the interest rate, the lower the receipt. We created a number of these trusts years ago, but recently have done less. It's a great opportunity to present your clients to save, the tax, to save them tax in the now when they need it, as opposed to later in life when they may not. And it's done at no extra cost to them. Suppose you have a client that's earning $100,000 of income annually. You, if you can save them several thousands of tax for the next few years, it's providing them significant value for something that they would have already done. So if you have clients that meet this criteria, you should talk to them about this sort of plan. Moving on, we're going to take a brief look at gifts of life insurance. Life insurance proceeds can be used to fund a charitable gift on death. There are three main ways to do this. The first is an outright gift of a fully paid out policy. Sometimes people have an old policy that they may no longer need for one reason or another. And this is an easy asset to give to charity. And the donor should not walk away from it. Of course, the current interest rates will be used to compute the amount of the receipt. Number two is the transfer of an existing policy on which premiums are still owing. And the third is the purchase of a new policy, initially naming the charity as owner and beneficiary. In the case where a donor wants to transfer a policy on which there are still premiums owing, but they no longer want to pay the premiums on it, um, the JCF would take the policy to the extent that the present value of the proceeds on death exceeds the present value of the premium costs. We perform an analysis taking into account different interest rates and also mortality. The increase in interest rates and of course plays a significant part in this analysis as it impacts the present values. Historically, the way that it would work is with a regular life insurance policy. An individual would take out a policy of say $100,000 and it would name the JCF as owner and beneficiary. Let's say they pay annual premiums of $3,600 over 10 years. Since it's paid to, by the individual by way of donation, they would get a tax receipt and effectively it would cost them $1,800 a year annually after tax. At the end of the day, their total cost would be $18,000 to create $100,000 of philanthropy upon death, which is a pretty good deal. Canada Life recently came out with a new product called My Par Gift, and it's designed for specifically for charitable giving. It's a single premium policy, which is a super simple, easy, and efficient way to give to charity, especially if it's coupled with something else, such as a mining flow-through donation. In that sort of example, the donor would use the mining flow-through donation to pay that single premium policy, and it would generate a significant charitable impact on death. So I ran through those fairly quickly, but the intent here was to give you a high-level overview of the different, some of the different plans and the effect that the recent changes have had on them. Um, we thank you again for your attention, and don't hesitate to reach out to anyone at the JCF if you would like to discuss further. Thank you. So I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so um, talking about new and not so new disclosure rules. Um, I think it's fair to say over the last five years or so there's been really like an explosion of disclosure rules, both uh, tax-specific rules and um, non-tax sort of corporate registry rules. 
Um, as we know in Quebec, we've had rules for a while. Uh, preventive disclosure rules for GAR have been around for, for a number of years. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been that much disclosure on that, but in any event. Um, but now we're sort of moving into, a, I call it a brave new world. I think a lot of the regimes that were proposed are now being enacted. They are enacted or they seem to be on the brink of being enacted. Uh, the Quebec rules are, are expanded from what they were originally. Um, and I think more importantly, or, or maybe more significantly for this audience, um, the federal rules, uh, both in terms of notifiable transactions and reportable transactions, I think stand to really change our day-to-day -day practice and our engagement um, with clients. So just a quick uh, overview of the agenda. So I'm going to speak very briefly, as, as briefly as possible, on uh, the Quebec Enterprise Registry Disclosure Rules, the REC, um, as well as uh, trust reporting. Uh, these are sort of old proposals that, uh, uh, with respect to the Quebec Enterprise Reg Registry, they're already in force. Um, and for the trust reporting, I feel like we've been talking about this for five years. It's finally, I think, going to be in force for taxation years that end uh, calendar 2023. So just a quick update for everybody on what those rules entail. Um, and then most of the time I'm going to spend, uh, as I mentioned, talking about uh, both Quebec disclosure rules and federal disclosure rules. Um, on the Quebec side, I think there's been some interesting, uh, scary comments made by Revenue Quebec, um, not in writing, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I guess. Um, but they've made comments at a number of panels over the past year and a half or so um, about how they view their disclosure um, obligations, their, their rules, so to speak. Um, and uh, the upshot is that they view them very broadly, and there's a number of situations where they think that they apply where it may be somewhat surprising. So I'm going to go through a few examples uh, where Revenue Quebec has given some, some guidance. Um, and on the federal side, um, obviously, there's a, there's a mix of, of things to discuss. Okay, very quickly on the REC. So uh, everybody's familiar with the REC. Obviously, it's the public registry of information relating to uh, enterprises that carry on business in Quebec, corporations, trusts, partnerships, uh, and sole proprietorships. Um, there is now in force the new ultimate beneficiary uh, disclosure requirement. Um, and the deadline for filing that aligns with your deadline for fi filing the annual updating declaration. So it's going to be different for every entity. Um, but I think the takeaway is that it's live, it's in force, so you need to, uh, you need to comply. Um, very quick overview of the rules. So obviously, um, what is an ultimate beneficiary? Who is it that needs to be disclosed? Well, an ultimate beneficiary is basically, uh, it's a natural person. Um, and the, the technical rule is that if they hold more than 25% of the votes or value uh, of any entity in the REC, uh, whether directly or indirectly, they need to be identified as an ultimate beneficiary. Um, and so if you think about it sort of in terms of how the REC is organized, you would look up, as you can today, um, you know, OPCO, um, and the OPCO uh, would list, you know, what it currently lists, which is, you know, first shareholder, you know, directors, and so on. And then there would be a separate section for ultimate beneficiaries in respect of that OPCO that would be listed. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that apparently, as of March 31st, 2024, you will be able to actually search the registry by an individual's name. So rather than having to find your OPCO and then see who the ultimate beneficiaries are, you could just put in, you know, John Smith, and it would list all of the entities in the REC in respect of which that person is, uh, is an ultimate beneficiary. And as I'll mention later, I think that's, it's, it's mostly the tax authorities are going to use that function, so I think it's just something to keep in mind. Um, in addition to the 25% votes or value test, there's a, a sort of a de facto control test. So if there's an individual who has the ability to exert influence that would amount to de facto control, um, that person is also, also an ultimate beneficiary for purposes of these rules. It includes trustees, it includes general partners as well. Um, there are some limited exceptions, although I don't think they're particularly relevant to, to, to our, this audience and to our, our, our day to day. Uh, but crown corporations, government corporations, not, some not for profit, so that might be relevant for some of you. Reporting issuers, financial institutions, certain trust companies are exempt, but uh, 
a plain vanilla private company, Opco, that we're very familiar with. I mean, it's very, very unlikely that they would be exempt from these, uh, these obligations. Um, in terms of what's publicly available versus what um, sort of needs to be provided to the registrar but is not public, so name, professional address, uh, the date of becoming or ceasing to be an ultimate beneficiary, and the type of control that the ultimate beneficiary has is all public. Uh, the dates of birth and the residential addresses, assuming that you do provide a professional address, are not uh, required to be publicly available in the REC. And obviously, there are significant penalties for, for non-compliance. Certain practice points on this, just very quickly, uh, I think you know, it's very important to have the right messaging to clients now for any of us who are in charge of updating the rec. I mean, I think you need to change your, your instruction letter or your messaging to clients. It needs to be very clear what types of people they need to be including. Um, and in particular, it's not obvious I, or, you know, it's in fact, it's probably impossible for an advisor to be able to identify for clients somebody who might be exercising influence, right, who's nowhere on the cap table, nowhere in the structure, but it's just a person who exists who may exercise influence that amounts to de facto control. I think it's impossible for us to know who that person is, so we need to be very clear in our messaging with clients that if that person exists, we need to know about it um, so, that the, uh, so that the REC is compliant. Um, I think from an audit and defensive tax practice perspective, um, you know, this is all publicly available. Uh, people who use the REC, you know how easy it is, right? It takes 30 seconds to find this information, and so uh, auditors are going to be able to use this as well. Um, so that means, you know, be very careful and considered about whether or not somebody is an ultimate beneficiary. Um, if you have a considered position that somebody is not, then you should not be disclosing them. You know, it, it's, it doesn't pay to take a very conservative position on this, I don't think. Um, the other point is that there's a, there's, there's a lot of overlap in the concepts that are relevant for this disclosure and that could be relevant for tax filing positions. So if you think about de facto control, for example, that's something that can be relevant to somebody's tax filing position. Uh, the question of, of value is also relevant often in, in tax matters, right? So if you're, I think it's just a, the practice point is just be careful about what position you're taking on the REC disclosure in terms of who might have shares that are worth 25% um, of, the, of the entity, make sure that that aligns with the position that you're taking in the tax filings, um, because obviously it's low-hanging fruit for an auditor, right? They're gonna look at their, the REC, they're gonna see who the ultimate beneficiaries are who are identified, and if there's some discrepancy between what's in the REC and what, you know, maybe what the position may be taken for tax filing uh, purposes, they, they will ask about that. Um, and um, yeah, obviously I mentioned the ability to search by individual, which will come next year, which I think is also important to remember. Okay, moving on to trust reporting. So I think we all know a, a little bit about the trust reporting. I think just this is just a refresher. It was deferred a number of times. It finally received royal assent in December of 2022. Um, and so all signs indicate that it will apply for trusts, uh, tax years that end on December 31st of this year. Um, the deadline aligns with the deadline for the T3. So it, we're talking March 30, 2024 for, for calendar 2023 year ends. Um, the new reporting rules apply to what are defined as express trusts, which basically means a trust that is uh, established or created by a set law, um, usually by deed, so the inter vivos trusts that we're all familiar with. Uh, and it also applies to non-resident trusts to the extent that those non-residents are required to uh, file a T3. Um, so the idea is that it doesn't apply necessarily to like a constructive trust, for example, that would be um, created by, by statute. Um, in terms of what the rules entail, so first of all, the, the exemption for filing the T3 that used to apply for, uh, for dormant trusts that had no activity in a, in a particular taxation year no longer applies. So those trusts will need to file. Um, and bear trusts uh, also need to file uh, a T3. Uh, in terms of the heightened or the amplified disclosure requirements, um, there's going to be, I think, a, 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 not a tax prepare, but I suspect it'll be a new schedule to the T3 for um, this information in respect of a number of categories of different people. 
Um, those categories include any set lores, uh, any trustees, beneficiaries, and any person with an ability to uh, exert influence over decisions on the appointment of income or capital. So again, it's very similar to the concept that we just talked about for the, uh, for the REC. Um, it just makes you, requires you to go a step further to identify, well, above and beyond the people who have these legal positions, um, is there anybody else who has some kind of form of influence that would need to be disclosed? Um, the definition of settlor is, is, is fairly broad, so it's, I think the important point is that it doesn't just mean the initial settlor who puts the gold coin in to settle the trust. Uh, it could apply to anybody who makes a contribution to the trust. Uh, it also applies to anybody who makes a loan to the trust uh, or transfers property, except where, the, in the case of the loan, it bears a reasonable rate of interest. And in the case of a transfer of property, the transfer occurs at fair market value. So to the extent that the person is, is, is dealing commercially with a trust, um, they, they should not be a settlor for the purposes of these rules. Okay, as I mentioned, there are some exemptions um, to the new trust reporting, uh, fairly narrow. So new trusts that have existed for less than three months um, there's a $50,000 de minimis test, although it's more narrow than it sounds, um, because the, the assets, the forming part of the $50,000, need to basically be cash or cash-like uh, investments. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually a more narrow exception than it seems. Uh, graduated rate estates are not covered, qualified disability trusts, um, trusts that underlie registered plans, RSPs, et cetera, are not, are not captured. Uh, the general trust account of a lawyer or a law firm is also not captured, uh, as well as a mutual fund trust and certain other uh, commercial trusts. So in terms of uh, practice points and for trust reporting, I think, uh, I think it should just factor in, I mean, it depends obviously what your practice is, but for those of us who draft trust deeds, you know, lawyers who work with trusts, I think it should inform the drafting of your trust deeds. So I think we've all seen the standard template trustee that has every beneficiary under the sun listed, you know, nieces, nephews, cousins, uh, any corporation that's controlled by a listed beneficiary. And that's helpful uh, in the sense that it, it, gives, it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of making distributions in the future. Uh, you don't necessarily need to amend your trust deed in order to, to do that. Um, but now it, it may be opening up that trust to very, very significant disclosure um, in the sense that if you have I think the best example is the, is the corporation that's controlled by a listed beneficiary. So we've seen a number of situations where you know, we have a business principal, he's constituting a trust, um, and that person may have a very, very expansive corporate structure, right? Lots of holding companies, lots of operating companies. Um, and if that person is a beneficiary uh, and the trustee provides that any corporation controlled by that person is a beneficiary, you know, you may have like 100 corporations that need to be disclosed in the T3 return for that, uh, for that trust. Um, and, that, and that may not be necessary, right? I think that you need to strike a balance between you know, realistic beneficiaries um, and, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, obligation to have to file reporting in, all of, in respect of all of these, all of these entities. One, one sort of solution that we've seen or mitigation technique that we've seen for the, for the corporation problem, and I think that this could apply, frankly, to any type of beneficiary, is um, you sort of take a two-pronged approach in your trust deed. So you would, you would identify a class of potential beneficiaries. So for example, you would say, if there's a corporation that's controlled by a listed beneficiary, that corporation could be a beneficiary under this deed. But in order to formalize their status as a beneficiary, the trustee needs to make a designation to say, okay, for this taxation year or going forward, you know, Exco is, is designated as a beneficiary. I, as the trustee, have the ability to do that under the deed. And I think at a minimum that gives you a position to say until that formality is done, that corporation is not necessarily a beneficiary and you wouldn't have to disclose. So that's, you know, maybe a, a workaround. Um, other things to keep in mind, obviously, if you've got a number of beneficiaries um, and not all of them are aware of the existence of the trust, so, you know, remote relatives, siblings, um, if you need to go and get information from those people um, to put into the, uh, into the T3 return, that may make them aware of the trust. And there may be, you know, a commercial or a business reason why you, you wouldn't want them to be aware of the existence of the trust. They could ask a bunch of questions. So that's just something else to uh, keep in mind. 
Um, and just before moving on to mandatory disclosure, um, I think the other point is that uh, they had announced in conjunction with the trust reporting rules a, a, a very significant gross negligence penalty um, in respect of trust filings. Um, that could go up to 5% of the highest fair market value of the assets of the trust in a year. Um, so that rule is also coming into force at the same time as the reporting. So just keep in mind that that's, that, will be, that will be live uh, going forward. If you thought uh, underused housing was scary, just wait. Um, okay, mandatory disclosure rules. We'll start with Quebec. I'm going to give a brief update on, on Quebec. So in addition to all of the GAR reporting, preventive disclosure, um, we have mandatory disclosure in Quebec for uh, what are called specified transactions. Um, so specified transactions are transactions that Revenue Quebec has identified, the sort of predetermined list of transactions, and Revenue Quebec uh, you know, publishes that list and says these are the types of transactions that we want to know about. If you're doing any transaction that's substantially similar to these listed transactions, everybody essentially uh, involved other than advisors where the threshold is a little bit different, but all of the taxpayers involved have a disclosure requirement in respect of the specified transactions, and we'll, we'll look at what the list is in a minute. Um, advisors and promoters can also be subject to disclosure under the Quebec rules, but the threshold is higher. It requires, it's, it's not a very helpful threshold um, because it requires that there be a form of like marketing or, or, or promotion or commoditization of the plan. Um, so if you do a transaction once and it's bespoke and you're just providing advice to a client and it happens to be a, a specified transaction, I don't think that uh, triggers advisor reporting. Um, but if, you're, if you've designed a template and you're going to market to say, here's a new plan that we came up with and we want to market to all of our customers, or our clients rather, um, then you may be into the uh, sort of past the threshold of, uh, of becoming a, a promoter or, 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 or an having an obligation to disclose as an advisor. Um, penalties are very high, um, both for taxpayers and for advisors, you know, up to $100,000 uh, plus 100% of our fees, um, and for the taxpayer, 50% of the tax benefit in the case of, uh, of a potential GAR. I think one thing to remember, and this is sort of where the rules dovetail a little bit with the preventive disclosure on the GAR, is that if you file a preventive disclosure, um, and it happens to be in respect of a specified transaction as well, the filing of the preventive disclosure may be helpful in the sense that it should uh, prevent you from being inadmissible for public contracts. So even if you lose your litigation after you disclose to Revenue Quebec uh, and the GAR applies, if you've made the preventive disclosure, then at least you won't have the prohibition on, uh, on public contracts, which depending on your industry can be a very uh, serious uh, consequence. So what are the specified transactions so far? Um, I've listed them on the slide. Um, I think the one that I'm going to focus on today and that's been the subject of the most discussion and which I think that we're all very familiar with is uh, multiplication of the capital gains exemption. Um, and I think, you know, to use a, a typical structure that we've probably all seen, you have, you know, a, a, an operating company that's started by the founder principal, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. X, you do an estate freeze at some point in time, you interpose a family trust to hold the growth shares of the OPCO going forward, and you have the principal's spouse, children, grandchildren, and other family members listed as discretionary beneficiaries of your trust. The idea being on a subsequent exit transaction, the trust will be able to uh, multiply the capital gains exemption among, among the eligible beneficiaries. So I think we've all seen you know, a variation on that structure. Um, We've also seen a lot of litigation on those types of structure, particularly in Quebec. Um, and Revenue Quebec is very interested in knowing about multiplication of the capital gains exemption, so, so much so that it's one of their um, listed transactions. Um, and what they're looking for um, is situations in which uh, somebody who has claimed the, the exemption, the capital gains deduction, like say the spouse or a child, um, receives the proceeds but ends up redirecting the proceeds of sale back to the principal, either as a form of gift or you just endorse the check or you do other some kind of transaction where the value associated with those proceeds is really being redirected back to the principal. Um, and as we'll see, Revenue Quebec um, interprets that transfer back very, very broadly. 
So just to go through a few examples, a few fact patterns on which Revenue Quebec has provided some comments. As I mentioned, um, take these with a grain of salt because Revenue Quebec has a specifically uh, not given this, uh, this, these responses in writing. They've only sort of given them verbally in, in, on panels. Um, particularly a lot of APFF conferences have been, have been um, scheduled and arranged over the past year and a half where Revenue Quebec has had a panel where they've responded to questions, sort of like a round table approach. Uh, they've responded to questions on what is and isn't caught. Um, so continuing to focus on the multiplication of the capital gains deduction, we've got a number of examples here that were presented to Revenue Quebec and uh, we just go through them quickly. So the first is, and in each of these examples, just so that I don't have to repeat myself, just assume that the proceeds that we're talking about are proceeds on which the capital gains deduction was claimed by either the child or the spouse in question. Um, so in the first example, you have proceeds that were allocated or distributed to a child, a minor child, uh, and those proceeds are held in a bank account, but because the child is a minor, um, the parent is the sort of beneficiary of that, or, or the holder of that account, rather, in trust. Um, and Revenue Quebec has, has confirmed that that is not a situation where you would have a specified transaction. So the fact that the parent has to be the trustee, so to speak, of the account, um, doesn't mean that the proceeds have been redirected back to the parent, um, and so that would not trigger a disclosure. Um, the second example is similar, but now we're talking about a joint bank account uh, between spouses. So assume that both spouses claim the deduction, uh, they put both of their proceeds into a joint bank account, and then, like most joint bank accounts are, they're used to fund various expenses. So maybe somebody buys a new residence for the family, uh, or maybe somebody finances a trip around the world. The question is, well, to the extent that that benefits both spouses, including the original principal, is that a return of the proceeds back to the, uh, to the principal? And it was a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but it was basically not necessarily, the family residence is probably okay um, in and of itself, but if there's a subsequent bequest of the sort of legal, full legal ownership of that residence to the original spouse, to the founder, so to speak, that could be caught. Um, and the trip around the world to the expense that there are a portion of those expenses are allocable to the principal, that could trigger disclosure. So this is like really broad uh, and in my view, like almost impossible to, to, to trace, right? Because people use joint bank accounts for, for, for everything, for day-to-day -day expenses. And so theoretically every dollar that benefits the original principal could trigger disclosure. So I think, you know, we need to, take a more considered view on that. Moving on to the next few examples, which I think are in some ways even more surprising. So in a situation in which a, a child receives proceeds of disposition on which the exemption is claimed, let's say on, a, on an exit, um, and then several years later, the child uses money or funds to subscribe for shares of the parent's holding company. Um, the question being, well, is that an indirect transfer of the proceeds back to the parent in the sense that now the parent's holding company is benefiting from the receipt of, of funds? Um, and again, the answer from Revenue Quebec was yes, possibly that would trigger disclosure. You would need to be a tracing of the funds to determine whether or not it was the original proceeds that were used. Um, and importantly, Revenue Quebec basically said like the, the interval of time or the lapse of time between the initial exit on wh where the, the exemption was claimed um, and, the, um, and the subsequent investment is not relevant. So it doesn't matter if it was five, ten years. In theory, you still need to do tracing. Um, and the last one, which has generated quite a bit of discussion over the past uh, few months, um, was a fact pattern where, and this is, I think, fairly common, um, where you, the trust realizes a gain um, and does its allocation of the gain out to the various beneficiaries who want to claim the exemption, um, and the distribution to a particular beneficiary is paid by way of a note. So the cash doesn't actually come out of the trust into the bank account of the beneficiary, but the trust, you know, makes a payment by way of a, by, in, in the example that Revenue Quebec looked at, it was a demand promissory note. Um, and Revenue Quebec was asked to consider the fact pattern where subsequent to that note being issued, the child doesn't demand repayment. So it just sort of stays outstanding. Um, and Revenue Quebec confirmed that yes, that would be a specified transaction because by, 
refraining from demanding repayment of the note, the child is basically sort of pushing the benefit of those proceeds back into the trust um, and back to the, uh, to the principal. So it's not, it's not a real transfer of the proceeds to the, to the child until, until the note is presumably um, repaid. Okay, so just on that last point, uh, in terms of the promissory note, since they made those comments sort of quietly last week, Revenue Quebec updated their, um, their website um, to provide uh, for a new excluded transaction. So an excluded transaction is basically, if you look, think about it in steps, you may start off having a specified transaction, which means you have to disclose. However, there are certain excluded transactions which would then carve you out from the disclosure requirement. Um, and in terms of an excluded transaction, they added um, last week um, the payment of the, of the distribution um, by way of a note, as long as the note is repaid within the 60-day period that would otherwise apply for disclosure. So it's a, it's a fairly narrow exemption, but at a minimum, it provides you with a sort of a self-help uh, to say, okay, well, I, I thought I was going to do this with a note, but I'd rather avoid disclosure, so I'm going to, you know, I'm actually going to repay that note within the 60 days. And if you do that in time, uh, and you don't have any other reason why your transaction is specified, you may be able to avoid the disclosure in that way. Just before moving on to the federal rules, um, I think just it's it's a bit scary, but it's important to keep in mind that the disclosure is just a disclosure, right? If you have a specified transaction, yes, you may have a requirement to disclose its revenue Quebec, but it doesn't. This is not a charging provision, right? This doesn't mean that the deduction is lost. It just means that revenue Quebec wants to know about it. They will presumably have a much easier time finding these transactions and auditing them. Um, but in terms of actually going the next step and denying the deduction, there needs to be a legal basis for that. Um, and we've seen Revenue Quebec challenging deductions in these situations before. They've uh, raised sham in some cases. They've raised GAR in some cases. Um, but the important point to remember is that there always needs to be a se second step. So you'll have another kick at the can to you know, protect your claim for the, for the exemption. It's just that you may have to disclose it in the first instance. It's also important to note that there, in, in the excluded transaction category that I just described uh, is included the non-taxable portion of the gain. Um, so uh, obviously when you claim the deduction, there's a taxable portion. That's the portion on which you're claiming the deduction, but there's also the non-taxable portion. Um, and Revenue Quebec has basically said, like, we don't really care what you do with the non-taxable portion because nobody would be paying tax on it anyway. Um, um, so it's not clear what that means practically. I think one way of looking at it is it kind of creates a, a buffer. So to the extent that you make an allocation out to a beneficiary of both the taxable and the non-taxable portion of a gain, beneficiary claims the capital gains deduction on the taxable portion. I think to the extent that you're impugned you know, transactions, your redirection transactions don't exceed the non-taxable portion, um, you may be okay. It gives you sort of a bit of, a bit of wiggle room in terms of, um, of, of potentially returning some proceeds um, or doing transactions that could be considered by Revenue Quebec to be a return of proceeds. Um, moving on to the federal <laughs> disclosure rules. So the federal disclosure rules fall into to three main categories. So uh, there's the existing reportable transaction regime, which is already in the Act and has been in the Act for a long time. Um, but it currently requires um, the existence of two so-called hallmarks in order to trigger reporting. And so I think for most transactions, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to have two hallmarks being, being met. And we'll go through what the hallmarks are in a second. Um, so the reportable transaction regime has been significantly expanded. Um, and how so? Um, well, I think the most important one is that now you only need one hallmark. Uh, and the one that we've been the most concerned about, I think, in the professional community has been the so-called contractual protection hallmark, which we'll look at a little bit more. Um, they, the finance has wavered a little bit in terms of coming into force. Originally, the disclosure requirement was going to come into force before the penalties. Now everything is deferred until royal assent, um, although the sense that I get is that royal assent is going to be pretty soon. Um, so I don't think we have very much time to, to prepare uh, for these disclosure rules. Um, second category, notifiable transactions. Um, so notifiable transaction regime is new on the federal side, uh, and it's, it's similar to what I was describing before in Quebec in terms of specified transactions. So what the feds have done is they've 
generated a list, I think, of six transactions um, that they are concerned about. They've designated those as notifiable transactions. So to the extent that you, a taxpayer, engages in a transa transaction that's substantially similar, but not necessarily identical to those listed transactions, there's a, a reporting obligation. And again, the coming into force for that disclosure is only upon royal assent. And the last category, just to say it, although I'm not going to talk about it today, is um, the uh, reporting of uncertain tax positions. So this only applies to you know, larger taxpayers um, that have audited financial statements. But essentially, there's an obligation to disclose uh, you know, what we would call tax provisions or uncertain tax positions um, that need to be provisioned in the financial statement. So basically providing a roadmap to the, uh, to the CRA as to what you think your soft spots are. So reportable transactions. So as I mentioned, two, um, I think there are two critical changes um, in the recent rules. So first of all, um, one of the conditions for having a reportable transaction is that there be an avoidance transaction. Uh, it used to be that there was the same definition of avoidance transaction as under the GAR, meaning that the primary purpose um, of the transaction had to be to obtain a tax benefit. They've now lowered that threshold um, to provide that it's uh, one of the main purposes of any transaction in the series is to obtain a tax benefit. So if you're doing, for example, an M&A transaction that has a pre-closing reorganization, either for the benefit of the seller or the buyer, chances are somewhere in the series you're going to have a transaction, one of the purposes of which, or one of the main purposes of which is, a, is, an, is, is to obtain a tax benefit. Um, so that's a very low threshold. Um, and then the second critical change is that, as I mentioned, previously you needed to have two out of three hallmarks apply in order for that transaction to be reportable. Now you only need one hallmark. So what are these hallmarks? Um, the first is that uh, a promoter or an advisor in respect of the transaction is entitled to a contingent fee uh, based on whether or not the tax benefit is obtained or based on the number of, of taxpayers who participate. The second hallmark is that the promoter or the tax advisor receives confidential protection. So they, the, the, in, so it's kind of like the reverse of privilege, for example, where the promoter or the advisor is saying to the client, you agree that you are going to keep this confidential. Um, and the third hallmark is, and this is the, the most problematic one, I think, in a lot of cases, is where the taxpayer um, or certain other per persons obtain a, con a defined term contractual protection in respect of the transaction. And that uh, contractual protection can include certain forms of insurance um, against uh, sort of insuring against the failure of the transaction to achieve a tax benefit. And so there's been, in each iteration of these proposals, there's been changes to the definition of contractual protection. They've broadened it, added exceptions, removed exceptions, and we've now landed on a new definition of contractual protection that I will uh, go through in, in some detail. Okay. Um, so where did they land in terms of a carve-out from contractual protection? I think originally the concern with these rules was that the, the definition of contractual protection was so broad that it could apply to, for example, a standard pre-closing tax indemnity or a standard indemnity in terms of tax reps and warranties in an M&A deal. So in any M&A deal or most M&A deals, uh, particularly in a private uh, company space, uh, sellers are going to provide an indemnity to the purchaser to say, listen, to the extent that there's any tax that arises for a pre-closing period or to the extent that I've breached my tax rep, that I've paid all of my taxes for a pre-closing period, I'm going to indemnify you for that. So you will have that contractual right to indemnification. Um, and we've also seen, I would say in the last five to seven years, a huge growth in rep and warranty insurance. Um, where third-party insurers will basically step into the shoes of the sellers in that context and say, and, and for, for a policy, for a premium, will say, we will, uh, we will insure these reps and warranties to the extent that that liability materializes, the insurer will pay out to either the company or to the purchaser, depending on who the beneficiary of the policy is. So the concern with the original rules was that this was broad enough to catch all of those types of indemnities, which basically means that every M&A transaction is a notifiable transaction. Um, and so the joint committee of the, uh, of the CBA and the CPA made a number of submissions on this point, as did other uh, groups. 
and there was a back and forth. And where they've landed in terms of the amended definition of contractual protection is that there's a carve out, which is on the screen, for insurance or protection that's integral to an agreement between arm's length persons for the sale or transfer of all or part of a business. And the insurance or protection is intended to ensure that the purchase price takes into account liabilities of the business immediately prior to the sale or transfer and is obtained primarily for purposes other than to achieve any tax benefit from the transaction or series. So it's a long-winded way of saying, we think, that if you're talking about a standard pre-closing tax indemnity, a standard indemnity in terms of reps and warranties, including tax reps and warranties, the idea with those is to say, well, I'm, I'm paying $100 for the company. If it turns out that it's only worth $95 because it was a $5 tax liability for a pre-closing year, you're going to indemnify me for that $5 so that I'm getting $100 of value at the end of the day. And I think that's clearly captured by the carve-out. Um, so, um, so I think there's, there's, that's, that's, that's relieving in nature. Um, but I think if, if you're talking about tax insurance, um, transaction insurance, which we're seeing more and more, so doing a transaction that gives a tax benefit, whether it's in the context of an M&A or not, and getting insurance for that, it's far from clear that that is not captured um, by the definition of contractual protection. Okay, uh, I have two minutes left apparently, so very quickly, I'm just gonna, just a few sort of um, remarks. So contingent fee hallmark, just to say it, I know a lot of SR and ED engagements are on contingency and those uh, in, have been carved out. So finance says that those are fine, they do not give rise to the uh, hallmark, so that's good. Um, there's been some changes on the penalties, although I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. The penalties are still there, they're still very significant. Notifiable transactions, there have not been significant changes really that are worth discussing here today um, from the original proposals. So I know that we've all seen a number of presentations on these rules, so I would refer you back to the general presentations that you would have seen on these disclosure rules. Generally, there hasn't been much movement on notifiable since the original proposals. Um, although one thing to note is that they actually they, they made this list of notifiable transactions before the substantive CCPC rules were enacted. And one of the transactions that was listed was manipulating CCPC status. So it's not clear whether that's like relevant anymore, um, but it's still there. So I suppose if you're somehow not caught by the substantive CCPC rules, you may still have a notifiable transaction. Obligation to disclose for advisors. I think the key thing to take away is that the threshold for reportable transactions is different than for notifiable. So for reportable, the advisor needs to have received either a contingent fee that meets the definition of the hallmark, or needs to have received a fee that is in respect of the contractual protection as defined, which I just talked about. Um, so it's a narrower scope of, of obligation to disclose for advisors. Whereas if you have a notifiable transaction, once you have a notifiable transaction, you have an obligation to disclose, basically in respect, if you've acted in respect of it, so it's much broader. So I just wanted to end with a few practice points. I think most of these I've covered. Um, so contractual protection, if it's a standard rep and warranty indemnity, a standard pre-closing tax indemnity, I think the consensus is that you should be okay. If you're doing, I'm just gonna say, a pipeline transaction and you're concerned about getting the tax benefit and you get insurance specifically for that tax benefit, it's less clear that that would be uh, exempt and you may indeed have a reportable transaction in that case. Um, I think that's it. I think most of this other stuff I've covered. I think from a practice points perspective, I think it's important because the rules are so broad, it's important to know sort of that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm in a law firm. I often see deals where the accounting firm will pr produce a memo to do a reorg. Here are the steps. And then they deliver it to the law firm. But it's really just the corporate group. I mean, even paralegals in the law firm who are doing the documentation. And the tax people in the law firm may not even be aware that this is happening. So I don't think that the paralegals and the corporate people are necessarily going to be in a position to identify whether that transaction that they're implementing is reportable. They're not tax lawyers. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's just, you need to have sort of like a heightened sense that, um, that, that there may be a reporting obligation. Check in with your colleagues in other departments to, to, to get a sense of what's going on uh, to see whether there may be some uh, reporting obligation that's getting missed. Um, 
And um, I suppose that's it. I mean, also know what other firms are doing. So if you're working on a transaction with two law firms, two accounting firms, you should work into your clauses in the agreements an obligation to notify if somebody intends to disclose because the last thing that you want is for the most conservative firm on the deal to say, we think this is reportable, and then you haven't reported it because you took an opposite position. Um, so I think it's just really important for everybody to have um, at least knowledge of what other people are doing. You might not be able to get to consistency in the sense you might not be able to hash it out and decide that everybody is going to disclose or not. Um, but you should at least be aware of what the other of what the other uh, professionals are doing. So I'll end on that. I'm probably over time. So thanks very much. Happy to take any questions. And one question to you, Linda. You mentioned something about some sort of new type of insurance. Correct. Could you explain how that works with this single premium? Because yeah, I've never so heard of it. Canada Life just came out with it. It's very recent. It's a single premium policy. So instead of paying annual premiums over 10, 20, whatever years. It's a one-time premium, and you get the proceeds paid upon death, and it's specifically designed for charitable givings. So the example that I gave was if you do a mining flow-through, for example, you would take the donation from that mining flow-through, example, $35,000, and that would be used to pay that single premium. So instead of doing it over a number of years, it's done in one shot. So it makes it very simple, very easy, and it's called My Par Gift. But who buys the policy, the JCF or the individual? It's the individual donor. But it names the JCF or the charity as the owner and beneficiary. Thank you for your question. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for your uh, comments today. In terms of the, um, the search function on the REQ website, when you're able to, in the future, search uh, ultimate beneficial owner, does that include their personal information, where they live? Yeah, so it would include, basically, you would go to the rec, and you would put in David Wilson. And fortunately for me, I don't think you'd get any results, but uh, let's say it would, it would have, it, you'd be able, you'd see, okay, let's say, you know, Opco X is, is an entity in respect of which I'm a benefic an ultimate beneficiary, you would be able to then look at that listing for that Opco X, which would include that information. So it would include my professional address, um, when I became a beneficiary and, or ceased to become, be a beneficiary. Um, what else? My, yeah, my name. But it wouldn't have the date of birth or your residential address. But it's important on the residential one, you have to put in a professional address. If you don't put in a professional address, the residential one is public. So the answer to your question is yes, it would be public one way or the no other. No security concerns the government has with this? I don't, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm sure they've looked at that. Uh, how thoroughly, I don't know. Um, but, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that in conjunction with the, um, the beneficiary reporting, there's also, and I'm not an expert on this, to be honest, mm -hmm. because it's mostly our, our corporate paralegal department that does this, but there's new like identification requirements for directors. I think they need like photo IDs and stuff like that to be posted. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a new world. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think Thank maybe you. somebody's going to correct me or add to that. The photo ID doesn't need to be posted, but it does need to be given to the rec. Exactly. Yeah. So and wouldn't you wouldn't be able to find the picture of the person, but it has to be provided. And yeah. if you give a professional address, you have to give the same professional address for every corporation you're involved with. So if you are involved with more than one and you want to use your office, that's fine, but you can't have different professional addresses for different corporations. Yeah, the, the question is the consultation process with either the federal government or provincial government. When the changes are being made, who, what sort of consultation occurs? Uh, on the disclosure rules? Well, there's a lot of different channels. So, I mean, the, from, a, from a legislative perspective, they have to, it has to be heard in committee, both by the House of Commons committee and by the Senate committee. So they invite representatives, for example, from the CBA or from the CPA um, to answer questions and provide comments. Um, but in addition to that, I mean, usually the professional organizations, like the Joint Committee, for example, will always provide representations to uh, to finance and provide comments. Uh, to be honest with you, I think most of that has probably already happened. Uh, like the federal rules are 
on the brink of being in force, I would say. Uh, I, I've heard that we're expecting a revised version of the form, the draft form, to be released even maybe sometime this week, uh, and some new guidance um, from the CRA, um, but I don't, I think there may be some tweaks still, but for the, for the most part, I think this legislation is gonna remain as is, and it'll be in force sh soon. I had a quick question for you, Eric, on the AMT. Because uh, we can usually control you know, triggering gains and triggering AMT, planning around it. Um, one situation where you typically can't control is, is death or departure. Uh, is there any uh, exception that you see or possibility or are people gonna face AMT in those situations? So AMT, maybe I wasn't clear on that. I, I know it was on the slide, but I didn't mention it. AMT does not apply on death, on the deemed disposition on death. Uh, however, if you are subject to EMT and then down the line you say leave Canada, um, I don't think you can recoup um, that tax because you're not paying otherwise uh, federal income tax. Uh, and I think same on death if you die after um, having AMT in a prior year. So you don't have to worry about AMT on the gain triggered on death, but if you leave Canada, you may have to do that calculation when you're calculating your gain. Correct. Right. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, okay. Uh, with that, then, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank our speakers. Okay. So the first award we have is for Robert Bart. Jonathan Bichet, Cello Karin, uh, Charles Gagnon, Mindy Maiman, Sheldon Miller, Jacob Nataf, Barbara Novak, Bradley Steinmetz. Robert Rage, Yu Wang, and Leon Yetnikov. La philanthropie détient le pouvoir de transformer des communautés entières et d'améliorer de façon significative la vie de millions de personnes. Un simple geste de bonté peut avoir des répercussions considérables sur la vie des gens. La Fondation communautaire juive de Montréal est fière d'inaugurer le Centre d'apprentissage philanthropique. A groundbreaking initiative that brings together professionals, donors and charities to create a better future for generations to come. We're excited to have you embark on this journey to change the world through philanthropy. Over the next 12 months, we will invite you to highly curated events designed to inspire and give you the tools to reach your personal and organizational goals. Philanthropy is about coming together, making a difference, and shaping the world we live in. When you join the Center for Philanthropic Learning, you'll be part of a movement of people who share and care. That's smart philanthropy.